Chapter 1 It had taken them many hours to fight their way out of the cave of the white worms. Even now, they could not be sure that some of the pallid monsters were not pursuing them, and the power of their weapons had almost been exhausted. Ahead, the floating arrow of light that had been their mysterious guide through the labyrinths of the Crystal Mountain still beckoned them on. They had no choice but to follow it, though as it had done so many times before, it might lead them into yet more frightful dangers. Alvin glanced back to see if all his companions were still with him. Alistra was close behind, carrying the sphere of cold but ever-burning light that had revealed such horrors and such beauty since their adventure had begun. The pale white radiance flooded the narrow corridor and splashed from the glittering walls. While its power lasted, they could see where they were going and could detect the presence of any visible dangers. But the greatest dangers in these caves, Alvin knew too well, were not the visible ones at all. Behind Alistra, struggling with the weight of their projectors, came Nerillion and Floranus. Alvin wondered briefly why those projectors were so heavy, since it would have been such a simple matter to provide them with gravity neutralizers. He was always thinking of points like this, even in the midst of the most desperate adventures. When such thoughts crossed his mind, it seemed as if the structure of reality trembled for an instant, and that behind the world of the senses, he caught a glimpse of another and totally different universe. The corridor ended in a blank wall. Had the arrow betrayed them again? No. Even as they approached, the rock began to crumble into dust. Through the wall pierced a spinning metal spear, which broadened rapidly into a giant screw. Alvin and his friends moved back, waiting for the machine to force its way into the cave. With a deafening screech of metal upon rock, which surely must echo through all the recesses of the mountain and awaken all the nightmare brood. The subterrane smashed through the wall and came to rest beside them. A massive door opened, and Callistron appeared, shouting to them to hurry. Why, Callistron? wondered Alvin. What's he doing here? A moment later, they were in safety, and the machine lurched forward as it began its journey through the depths of the earth. The adventure was over. Soon, as always happened, they would be home, and all the wonder, the terror, and the excitement would be behind them. They were tired and content. Alvin could tell from the tilt of the floor that the subterrane was heading down into the earth. Presumably, Callistron knew what he was doing, and this was the way that led home. Yet, it seemed a pity. Callistron, he said suddenly. Why don't we go upward? No one knows what the Crystal Mountain really looks like. How wonderful it would be to come out somewhere on its slopes, to see the sky and all the land around it. We've been underground long enough. Even as he said these words, he somehow knew that they were wrong. Elistra gave a strangled scream. The interior of the subterrane wavered like an image seen through water. And behind and beyond the metal walls that surrounded him, Alvin once more glimpsed the other universe. The two worlds seemed in conflict, first one and then the other predominating. Then, quite suddenly, it was all over. There was a snapping, rending sensation, and the dream had ended. Alvin was back in Diaspa, in his own familiar room, floating a foot or two above the floor as the gravity field protected him from the bruising contact of brute matter. He was himself again. This was reality, and he knew exactly what would happen next. Elistra was the first to appear, she was more upset than annoyed, for she was very much in love with Alvin. Oh, Alvin, she lamented as she looked down at him from the wall in which she had apparently materialized. It was such an exciting adventure. Why did you have to spoil it? I'm sorry, I didn't intend to. I just thought it would be a good idea. He was interrupted by the simultaneous arrival of Callistron and Floranus. Now listen, Alvin, 
began Callistron. This is the third time you've interrupted a saga. You broke the sequence yesterday by wanting to climb out of the Valley of Rainbows. And the day before, you upset everything by trying to get back to the origin in that time track we were exploring. If you won't keep the rules, you have to go by yourself. He vanished in high dudgeon, taking Floranus with him. Nerillion never appeared at all. He was probably too fed up with the whole affair. Only the image of Elystra was left, looking sadly down at Alvin. Alvin tilted the gravity field, rose to his feet, and walked towards the table he had materialized. A bowl of exotic fruit appeared upon it, not the food he had attended, for in his confusion his thoughts had wandered. Not wishing to reveal his error, he picked up the least dangerous looking of the fruits and started to suck it cautiously. Well, said Elustra at last, what are you going to do? I can't help it, he said a little sulkily. I think the rules are stupid. Besides, how can I remember them when I'm living a saga? I just behave in the way that seems natural. Didn't you want to look at the mountain? Alistra's eyes widened with horror. That would have meant going outside, she gasped. Alvin knew that it was useless to argue further. Here was the barrier that sundered him from all the people of his world, and which might doom him to a life of frustration. He was always wanting to go outside, both in reality and in dream. Yet, to everyone in Diaspora, outside was a nightmare that they could not face. They would never talk about it if it could be avoided. It was something unclean and evil. Not even Jesserac, his tutor, would tell him why. Alistra was still watching him with puzzled but tender eyes. You're unhappy, Alvin, she said. No one should be unhappy in Diaspar. Let me come over and talk to you. Ungallantly, Alvin shook his head. He knew where that would lead, and at the moment, he wanted to be alone. Doubly disappointed, Alistra faded from view. In a city of ten million human beings, though Alvin... In a city of ten million human beings, thought Alvin, there was no one to whom he could really talk. Arestin and Etania were fond of him in their way, but now that their term of guardianship was ending, they were happy enough to leave him to shape his own amusements and his own life. In the last few years, as his divergence from the standard pattern became more and more obvious, he had often felt his parents' resentment, uh, not with him, that perhaps was something he could have faced and fought, but with the sheer bad luck that had chosen them from all the city's millions to meet him when he walked out of the Hall of Creation twenty years ago. Twenty years. He could remember the first moment and the first words he had ever heard. Welcome, Alvin. I am Ariston, your appointed father. This is Etania, your mother. The words had meant nothing then, but his mind had recorded them with flawless accuracy. He remembered how he had looked down at his body. It was an inch or two taller now, but had scarcely altered since the moment of his birth. He had come almost fully grown into the world, and would have changed little, save in height when it was time to leave it a thousand years hence. Before that first memory, there was nothing. One day, perhaps, that nothingness would come again, but that was a thought too remote to touch his emotion in any way. He turned his mind once more toward the mystery of his birth. It did not seem strange to Alvin that he might be created, in a single moment of time, by the powers and forces that materialized all the other objects of his everyday life. No, that was not the mystery. The enigma he had never been able to solve, and which no one would ever explain to him, was his uniqueness. <laughs> Unique. It was a strange, sad word, and a strange, sad thing to be. When it was applied to him, as he had often heard it done when no one thought he was listening, it seemed to possess ominous undertones that threatened more than his own happiness. His parents, his tutor, 
Everyone he knew had tried to protect him from the truth, as if anxious to preserve the innocence of his long childhood. The pretense must soon be ended. In a few days, he would be a full citizen of Diaspa, and nothing could be withheld from him that he wished to know. Why, for example, did he not fit into the sagas? Of all the thousands of forms of recreation in the city, these were the most popular. When you entered a saga, you were not merely a passive observer, as in the crude entertainments of primitive times which Alvin had sometimes sampled. You were an active participant, and possessed, or seemed to possess, free will. The events and scenes which were the raw material of your adventures might have been prepared beforehand by forgotten artists, but there was enough flexibility to allow for wide variations. You could go into these phantom worlds with your friends, seeking the excitement that did not exist in Diaspa. As long as the dream lasted, there was no way in which it could be distinguished from reality. Indeed, who could be certain that Diaspa itself was not the dream? No one could ever exhaust all the sagas that had been conceived and recorded since the city began. They played upon all the emotions and were of infinitely varying subtlety. Some, those popular among the very young, were uncomplicated dramas of adventure and discovery. Others were purely explorations of psychological states, while others again were exercises in logic or mathematics, which could provide the keenest of delights to the more sophisticated minds. Yet though the saga seemed to satisfy his companions, they left Alvin with a feeling of incompleteness. For all their color and excitement, the varying locales and themes, there was something missing. The sagas, he decided, never really got anywhere. They were always painted on such a narrow canvas. There were no great vistas, none of the rolling landscapes for which his soul craved. Above all, there was never a hint of the immensity in which the exploits of ancient man had really taken place, the luminous void between the stars and planets. The artists who had planned the sagas had been infected by the same strange phobia that ruled all the citizens of Diaspar. Even their vicarious adventures must take place cozily indoors, in subterranean caverns or in neat little valleys surrounded by mountains that shut out all the rest of the world. There was only one explanation. Far back in time, perhaps before Diaspar was founded, something had happened that had not only destroyed man's curiosity and ambition, but had sent him homeward from the stars to cower for shelter in the tiny closed world of Earth's last city. He had renounced the universe and returned to the artificial womb of Diaspar. The flaming, invincible urge that had once driven him over the galaxy and to the islands of mist beyond had altogether died. No ships had entered the solar system for countless aeons. Out there, among the stars, the descendants of man might still be building empires and wrecking suns. Earth neither knew nor cared. Earth did not. But Alvin did. <laughs>